Welcome to Inside the Outside. I'm Gary Kirk. And I'm Christy Kirk. This week we're going to be talking to everybody's favorite bling dealer, Dutch. I thought you were talking about Tiffany's. No, it's Dutch from DutchwareGear.com. I know, the maker of all wonderful things, hammock related and all kinds of little gadgets and doodads that do amazing things with almost no weight to them. So, Chrissy, how are you doing after the race yesterday? Well, it was only a 5K, so I'm not, you know, hurting too much, but I am still rehabbing a hip injury, and that was annoying. But the race was terrific. We ran in Sunset Beach. We've been doing this coastal series that's really fun. And um, Sunset Beach, this was the first time we'd ever been there, and it was just gorgeous. Yeah, turned out to be a really cool little beach town that um, just kind of tucked away one of those little hidden gems. This is the first one that's had any incline to it. Um, yeah. The only saving grace was that it had a beautiful bridge that crossed over the intercoastal waterway. So the sun was coming up as we were going over this. So, you know, it wasn't too bad of an incline. It was a long, slow hill. Let's be honest. (laughs) It was it was a a long, (laughs) slow hill. But I was excited that we got to go across the bridge because all of these beach towns are connected to the mainland by these beautiful bridges with amazing views. And this is the first time we've gotten to run across them because the half marathons in each run have done it, but we haven't gotten to. And the sun was rising across the water. It was spectacular. Now, it was hard. I mean, I... I walked the hill, the bridge the second time. We went, crossed the bridge twice because the route is a loop. And the first time I ran um, the incline, but on the way back, it was like, forget it. I am walking until I get to the top. And then I, I ran all the way. But it's a long, slow hill. It was a fun one, though. Yeah, the return trip across the bridge did slow me down. Um, the one thing I was most disappointed about was not seeing any alligators. We saw the signs warning about alligators, and I was like, oh, wow, I could actually see an alligator on this run. And uh, didn't see any. Maybe it was a little too cold too early in the year for him. I don't know, but uh, maybe next time. Yeah, I was okay not seeing alligators. <laughs> <laughs> the sunrise worked for me. It was beautiful, so... This series, I know we're supposed to run for other reasons, but I love big, awesome medals. Yes. And this series has really awesome, beautiful medals, which is half the reason we're doing it. And yep. Doing it for one, the medals and for the shirts. Yeah, uh, they have great shirts, too. Physical really fitness and personal health are, you know, just secondary. Yeah, uh, well, it's not like we're training for these runs. So I don't oh, I, I don't train at all. The only time I run is uh, for a medal. Yeah, and I've been off for three weeks trying to get my hip back. Um, so anyway. And they give you free beer and barbecue at the end of it, too. So there is that motivator. Yeah, that's not a motivator for me, but that metal, man. Like I said, (laughs) I I like some bling. I appreciate you giving me your beer ticket. Um, it, it, It went down nicely. So one place I may get to see an alligator is a little later on in the week. I'll be headed down to Columbia, South Carolina to join up with Scott Buff from Terrapin Outfitters on a paddle trip. And this is a pretty exciting paddle trip because it's not just a fun outing. You're actually raising money for a good cause, right? That's exactly right. We've teamed up with the Children's Cancer Partners of the Carolinas to try to raise some money for uh, children and families who are battling cancer. A really good cause. Now, tell us about this trip. How far will you travel? Well, depending on the exact route that we end up taking, which could be dictated by weather, um, it'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 170 miles over the course of a week. Okay, so how many miles per day are you out there paddling in a kayak? Give or take, it'll be about 30 miles uh, per day that we have to um, do. And this is a heck of an undertaking. Um, I personally have never paddled more than 10 miles in any given day. So uh, to triple that is going to be interesting, to say the least. Is there going to be like an EMT that follows along the road along the river (laughs) just in case you need it? Well, it sounds really fun, and I'm sure it's going to be a great time. Can't wait to hear all about it. Yeah, we're going to be uh, posting on social media every day, so make sure to pay attention to the Inside the Outside and Terrapin Outfitters Facebook and Instagram feeds uh, over the coming week. I'll be driving down on Wednesday, and then we'll be launching Thursday morning, and we'll be doing, uh, you know, updates throughout the uh, trip. So it should be pretty exciting. I'll tell you the biggest, um, I guess, nerves that I have around this is that until today, I had never actually been in a kayak. (laughs) 
Yeah, I know. I, I've canoed, it seems like, my entire life. But, you know, when this whole thing came up and I started uh, talking to them about it, it's like, oh, you need you need to get a kayak. A canoe is not going to cut it. You're not going to be able to make the mileage. And so I did. Uh, Scott helped me pick out a good kayak. I went out and tested it today. And I got to say, it's way more comfortable than I realized. It is a little more um, wobbly. I felt a little top heavy when I first got in it. But after a few minutes, you know, I kind of got the, the hang up of it, uh, paddling it and steering it around and everything. And, you know, it worked out really good. And um, I actually went out today, not planning to fish, but while I was out there test driving this thing, I started noticing fish just literally jumping out of the water all around me. And um, for those that don't know, this is a special time on the waters for white bass. If you live in an area where there are white bass in the lakes, around you. Check out the rivers or the streams right now that uh, feed into these lakes. The white bass will go up in them to spawn. And today was one of those magical days where I, it was like fishing in a bucket. I literally caught 72 white bass in about two and a half hours. And I, I caught them literally all in the same hole. It was it was insane. I've never experienced anything like it. And of course, you threw them all back. Absolutely. Because yeah. It's spawning season. Now, are they stocked? No. These are naturally occurring. Yeah, this happens every year in the spring. Um, if you are interested in uh, getting in on this uh, particular, um, you know, run of the white bass, it usually for our area anyway, here in uh, eastern North Carolina, usually happens somewhere um, starting in March. But the end of March, 1st of April has always been my um, sort of sweet spot to find them. It's about a six week period that the fish uh, are really active. But if you can hit that that two to three week period in the middle of that, it is it is amazing. And, uh, you know, for me, I like to use a little um, uh, rooster tail, uh, eighth ounce uh, rooster tail spinner. Um, also to these little paddle tail um, swim baits that look like little minnows. Uh, anything that looks like a little minnow and, you know, is kind of shiny, it, it's, it's going to bring them out. There was another guy fishing right uh, across the river from me today, and he caught just as many. And he and I both were just like jaws on the on the ground because we were catching so many fish. It was absolutely off the hook. So the fish like shiny things too, huh? I, that's apparently the theme of our show today. It, it kind of is, you know, metals, uh, shiny things, you know, everybody likes something shiny. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I know people are done listening to us ramble. Let's get on to this interview. Well, Dutch, we really appreciate you joining us on the show today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I've been a fan of you and your products ever since I got into hammock camping. Um, you're you're a legend in the industry. So I, I'm curious, you know, have you always been an outdoor person or is, uh, you know, if not, when did you get into this whole outdoor world? Well, I grew up um, with a love for the outdoors. Mostly it was hunting. I think that, that mainly because my family was kind of into that and we do kind of live out in the country or at least it used to be country before it all became overdeveloped and um but it was hunting that I decided that I was going to hike the Appalachian Trail and I really wasn't that much of a hiker but that's what really got the ball rolling so when it comes to you know getting outside um do you like to do long hikes short hikes car camping all the above what is it that you know really excites you to be able to get out in the woods well, my availability to get on long hikes has been limited ever since starting the business, which is kind of ironic. But the um, I do still get out for um, for weekends and things of that. And lately, I've been feeling more passionate about um, doing bike backpacking and, and camping. You know, using my bike, which I find to be also good exercise. Yeah, um, I actually have a uh, an annual bike packing trip that we do in West Virginia, which is where I'm originally from, and um, we're over in the radio quiet zone. We go into the Cranberry Glades area along the Cranberry River. Absolutely love that. You know, the bicycle, like you said, it's a good uh, good exercise. But also, once you get to base camp, you can take off on the bike and go fishing, or you know, whatever it is that you're looking to do. Yeah, exactly. Also, I love gear and. Bike packing really has a lot of cool gear. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like that happy uh, spot between backpacking and car camping. Yeah, exactly. So I wonder, your first big trip was the Appalachian Trail. 
I'm guessing you didn't have a hammock on that. Actually, I was probably one of the first people to hike the Appalachian Trail in a hammock. And oh, that's awesome. My first, um, my first night in a hammock was in a Hennessy, and it was on Springer Mountain. Oh, wow. wow. That, that's, that, that's a bold that's a bold move. You know, a lot of people um, we always tell people you need to experiment before you get out on the trail because you don't want to be learning there. But um, uh, apparently it worked out well for you. Yeah. Being dropped off in Georgia with, with a hammock and I, they didn't have underquilts at the time. So I had a, a Z rest that I used for insulation and a sleeping bag. And that is that's being committed. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> So you said your your Hennessy was your uh, first hammock. Um, uh, I know you make a, a lot of your own hammocks. Uh, do you uh, still have that uh, original Hennessy sort of a memento, I guess? I, I do still have it. And um, at the time, the Hennessy hammock was the um, best backpacking hammock out there. Um, and and actually, there was only about two that were available. There was that or Clark, and Clarks tend to be pretty pretty heavy. And, and what year was this that you uh, tackled the Appalachian Trail with a hammock? That was 2003. Wow. And so how did it progress from going on your first long distance hike with a hammock to becoming one of the most well-known res- and respected hammock manufacturers? Well, after, after I got done with the trail, I got into wanting to make my own gear and the hammock industry was completely void of innovation. So um, I began making my own gear and it led me to a couple websites. Um, the ironic part of that is I was, I was kind of too cheap to go buy some new gear. So I started, started producing my own and, and now I wind up owning an incredible amount. Um, <laughs> but, but the, I, I started getting hooked up with, with different forums and it wound up taking me to hammock forums mostly because I wanted to make a quilt. And I really enjoyed the give and take of the early years of hammock forums. They had a lot, it was a bunch of bearded guys with sewing machines, just trying to figure this stuff out on their own. (laughs) Yeah. I I went down a similar path. Uh, you know, whenever I got started, uh, wanted to make my own gear, um, and, ended up on the hammock forums and you're right some of those early videos video quality wasn't great but the passion was there and the instruction and helpfulness was definitely there yeah and actually i fought against being a vendor uh for as long as i could because the the vet, people becoming vendors actually hurt that diy community because once people started coming out with making companies and making products nobody wanted to share their ideas anymore and unfortunately that made it go to the wayside. Yeah, and I remember in the beginning, uh, your site was mostly um, different resources for people that wanted to do DIY. Uh, in the beginning, that's where I went to, you know, get my uh, straps or my buckles and you know, sewing materials and things like that. Um, what prompted you to finally break over and start making your own um, hammocks? Well, one of the things that I wanted to do in getting to DIY was all the fabrics. And I was making some darn good hammock fabrics. So um, I was able to produce a, a hammock fairly cheap. Um, and and th- when I did that, I was able to sell what was really my forte was suspensions. I was doing a lot of titanium doodads and stuff. So um, So if I sold a hammock, People always got the suspension that came with it. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, doodads. Um, I am ashamed to say how many doodads of yours I have, uh, although I know I'm not alone. Um, everybody t- likes to talk about their various Dutch bling. Uh, the first titanium items that I ever had uh, came from your site. Uh, I love the the fleas and the um, the worms and things like that. Super, super handy, super functional, um, really good products. Thank you. They are something that we're very proud of. And we, we like taking that nature thing by calling everything bugs and bringing it into bringing it into our gear. And I'm wondering what you might have on the horizon. What what ideas are you are you still working to innovate? Um, yes, we actually release um, at least one product every week and probably more. Wow. Now, many of them are very small um, and maybe it's just some special cord lock that we found. Um, but we just recently came out with a, what we call the pup tent, which is a small tent 
that hangs off of your hammock suspension so that your dog can have an enclosed area at night. Because that's one of the challenges we have with the hammock sometimes is having a place for your dog. Um, we are have been continually working in um, Dyneema composite fabrics, and um, we are going to be coming out with a new line of tarps there. And we also have a very special hammock um, that is on the horizon that I can't give any more information than that <laughs> on, but we hope to release it within the next six months. And it's something that we've been working on for over a year. So you can expect it to be pretty well developed when it does really get released. Wow. Now, how many people are on your team? You're making fabrics. You're doing these innovations in design, not to mention all of the, you know, suspension pieces. How many people are working with you? There is currently 23 people that work here. Wow. And it started just with you? Uh, yes, it started in my basement. And um, and at first, my business model was that I was I was never going to hire anybody because I didn't want to be an employer. <laughs> um, and I was going to keep it small. And, and if I needed somebody, I would just subcontract out the work. But you just you can only do that for so long. It has to get, it has to grow. It just and, and still um, we had a 20 percent increase in sales uh, just this last year. Oh, wow. So we're still growing. Well, I think by keeping it in house, um, you're able to uh, maintain that high level of quality that people expect out of your product. Because you know, while you you might be really cranking out some product these days, it's still very much um, you know you know a cottage vendor approach. Uh, the one thing that I liked is if you ever have a question or a problem or you know whatever it might be, you can pick up the phone and call, and you're going to be talking to either you or one of the people there that you personally uh, uh, oversee. Uh, that is correct. And we have a lot of outdoor enthusiasts that work here. Um, and uh, particularly someone in, in, in our customer service, Carolyn, she, um, she uses this gear very often and, and, and is very good, gives the same advice as what I would when it comes to making purchases or how to set up the gear. And that goes, uh, especially for my management staff, that um, they they know and use this gear and and also it's taken a lot off of my plate i'm no longer the sole person doing the designing that pup tent was actually brought up by someone in my staff and and developed by the seamstresses i think it's a great product it's definitely something that uh fills a niche uh when you get out on the trail so many people have a dog with them uh you know it's a lot of people are solo hikers but they take their dog along with them uh that's their their uh, their trail partner so that that's a great niche there yeah, I could have used that in the in the past. So I'll be looking forward to checking that out. I'm wondering, since you've been in the hammock world for so long and are certainly a pioneer in this community, what are some of the mistakes or, or maybe some advice you could give to someone curious about going hammock camping for the first time? Well, it's always good to test it out in your backyard. Um, I like to I like to go um, over prepared for weather because I don't want to be cold. And I think one of the biggest things is when, when you're just getting into this, if, if you were to go out and get the best of everything, which you don't know um, exactly what that need is just yet, it would be very expensive, but you can get a netless hammock for something pretty inexpensive. And you can use some of your, your gear that you already have, the pad and, and a sleeping bag. You can get a tarp for easily $100. You can get a hex tarp. So you can get in this, um, go out camping, use it one or two times, and then start to be picking out your gear. And, and also make sure that you really like it because a lot of people get into this and they wind up not using it and they wind up having to sell everything. Yeah, I know when uh, you first start, especially now that there are so many options out there, it can seem overwhelming, um, but it really doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, a lot of people start sort of on that more complicated end, and I, I think it scares them away at sometimes, um, you know, but really at the heart of it, it's it's just a hammock with a tarp and, you know, th throw, your, throw your pad and your blanket in there and you're good to go. You know, I am guilty of making it overwhelming because I'm always <laughs> driving to releasing products. Yep. Um, but still, my philosophy in making the gear and when I go hiking and um, and when when 
when I, t- I tell people just keep it simple as possible. It, it's, it's, it's going to probably grow more than what you really want it to, but just j- try to keep it as simple as possible. Well, I think that's great advice for anyone in the hammock camping world, but we talked about newbies because I think it can be really overwhelming to start in this world. But what about the person who's been hammock camping for years? What What's maybe a tip or an idea that might help them that they're not aware of? Um, well, site location is very important when it comes to avoiding weather. Really really kind of knowing the lay of the land and, and what's going to happen if the wind changes or, or or how the wind's going to be blowing that night. You can There's things that you can do um, that can make it so that you need less uh, insulation and such. Also, I like to color code um, a lot of my gear. So there is a, a, a red suspension where I want the head of my hammock. And I follow that through everything. I'm not really so worried about the color of my gear, but I will use color um, because when you are setting up at dusk, it is really hard to see which end of your quilt is is the slightly wider end than the, than the foot end. So I, I like I like to use that and it kind of prepares everything for you. Oh, that's a great tip. Yeah, you are actually the first person to bring that up. And when I was uh, doing the DIY stuff for uh, Christy and I, um, I actually did color coordinate that. I don't know if you noticed it. It wasn't just a, a stylistic choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm curious. Do you have any uh, big uh, trips or events planned uh, for this year? Well, this business does um, take me a lot of places. As a matter of fact, I'm about to go on this trip where I'm going to, um, on Sunday, I'm going to New York City. On Monday, I'm flying out of Newark to to the SHOT Show, which is going to be um, out in Las Vegas. From there, I'm going to go to Hancon for the next weekend. And... That's around Orlando, and it's about 300 people camp out. From there, um, a- a- after we go home for one day, we're going to be going back out to the Outdoor Retailer Show, which is out in Denver, Colorado. That's all within oh, less than two weeks. Wow. You are a busy man. Now, for trips, though, I, I have been, I, I did um, two long bicycle backpacking trips. And basically, I've ridden my bike from Kansas City to Ohio this year. Oh my gosh! And and that is, I, I, I'm just getting my feet wet in it. But it's something that I'm really enjoying, and I think it will. Um, I would like it to be um, a, a bigger part of what I do. I'm able to get and hoping to get even more out of the office this year. And I've been going with um, with Adam from Hammock Gear which we have been very close friends since before we um, either, either of us owned companies and, and we met hiking actually in Wisconsin and we've been friends ever since. So we, we uh, we've been riding together and he's, he's actually um, talking about doing a transcontinental bike ride this next year. And that's always been my dream. So I'm probably going to tag along a little bit for that. Oh, that's terrific. Now, can we anticipate some bike camping gear making its way into your product lineup? Absolutely. Actually, that, that is, that is something that, that, I mean, we, we're so close to, um, to, to having all the right materials for all that and all the, all the hardware and all the buckles and it really fits us really well. So, um, and and also that market, I, I think it could use a Dutch and, 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 we got we got the printers to be able to print up these things. We could do custom frame packs, and actually, I'm doing right now a custom frame pack um, for the developer of the Hang Time Hook, and and uh, and we are um, making one for him. I'm really anxious to see that. I think that is a, a market that is primed, like you said. They need a Dutch. Uh, that is that is an untapped area. Uh, I love to see that. It also justifies me riding off my bike. <laughs> there <So>. you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to get your silver linings where you can. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, we've talked a little bit about products that you might have in the pipeline, but what do you see for the future of hammock camping as a whole? Well, um, I would say that there was this big trend over the last five years of a lot of products going overseas. Uh, that's going to continue. Um, 
I would say that that has forced out of the market some of the smaller cottage vendors, and there has been a um, there's been less new cottage vendors that have that have entered. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because I believe that's where a lot of the innovation comes. I believe you will you will get less expensive gear, um, but I'm afraid that some of the innovation either either a lot of it has already been done already, or people perceive it as being done already, or it's just going to be more copies of the same. Um, beyond that, there is. Um, always new fabrics that are coming out, making things lighter and making things more simplistic. There's there's um, some new designs that have been coming out. I, w- I would say uh, Warbonnet has come up with some some great designs, and people are always able to incorporate the titanium, the Cuban fiber, the um, I should call that Dyneema composite fabric because they changed the name of it, and and also like. Things like the xenon, the polyester sill, have have made improvements in the gear that's already out there. Yeah, I I would love to see the Dyneema uh, prices come down, which I, I think that'll happen with the you know prevalence of it getting used out in the industry. Um, I would love to uh, make my own uh, gear with some Dyneema, but uh, it, it was it was just a little too pricey for me when I was uh, making our, our first round of gear. Unfortunately, that trend has been going up. They were <laughs> um, they, they, they were bought out by somebody, and um, they are. It is. It is. A, I, it's some of the perfect gear. It's perfect for making tarp. Um, it's fantastic. If if you ever get a Z pack backpack, um, they are. It's it's fantastic gear for that. There's some other new companies that are coming out with like Light AF has a, been working in the Dynamic composite fabric and and making some great gear out of that. Um, but unfortunately it is pricey. Very good for the DIYer though, because it, it often uses tape instead of, instead of sewing. So you don't have to have all the sewing skills in the world and you can produce things like a stuff sack pretty easily. That's very cool. Well, Dutch, it's been a pleasure talking to you and you've shared such great information. I'm wondering as we wrap up, if you have any parting words you'd like to share with our listeners. Oh, yeah. Try to try to get out there and enjoy yourself. Get out in the wilderness. It's. Um, I, I think this world could use a lot more of getting away from your phone, getting away from the 24-hour news cycle, or caught up in whatever drama is going on, and, and and getting out and getting inside your own head and seeing what's 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 not only outside but inside your own head. I think that is a perfect note to end on. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that uh, sentiment. Uh, Well, again, Dutch, it's been uh, awesome talking to you, and we'll be sure to include links to your website uh, in our show notes, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at some point uh, down on the trail. Thank you for doing this, and I'll end it with thank you, everybody. Inside the Outside is proudly brought to you by Terrapin Outfitters. Terrapin Outfitters is an innovative company that specializes in developing clothing and gear that enhance people's enjoyment of outdoor activities. Check them out at terrapinoutfitters.com. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Look for the handle Inside the Outside Show. For links to our social media and other stuff that we talk about in the show, be sure to check out the show notes and our website, insidetheoutsideshow.com. Inside the Outside.